Okay, so um, I don't know if uh, Shun, uh, Shintaro san will uh, make the uh, uh, We are ready to go. We are ready. Okay, so okay. can you tell us if we can start now? Yeah, sure. Okay, so okay, good evening and uh, good morning uh, and good night in uh, Latin America. We are starting this uh, first webinar from uh, Ameg and CIE, and also with the unbalanced support from Temdek in Japan from Kyushu University. And it's, it is a very great honor for me to uh, introduce you with the uh, president of uh, Temdek, Dr. Tomohiko Moriyama. Hello, nice to meet you, everyone. This is Dr. Tomohiko Moriyama from Kish University Hospital. Uh, as a business trip, I'm now in Argentina. It's my honor to co-chair this session uh, with Dr. Miguel Tanimoto. So uh, thank you for joining us today. Thank you, uh, Professor Moriyama. And now I will introduce you to uh, our first uh, lecturer, is uh, Professor Robert Becara. He is uh, currently an associate professor at Queen's University, and his clinical and research interests are, include POEM, ESD, magnifying endoscopy, diagnosis, and resection of early gastrointestinal neoplasia. He completed a long training in the third space endoscopy fellowship under Dr. Haruhiro Inoue at the Showa University Digestive Disease Center in Koto Toyosu Hospital in Tokyo, Japan. His training in Japan included peroral endoscopic myotomy, peroral endoscopic tumor resection, endoscopic submucosal dissection, anti-reflux mucosectomy, and magnifying endoscopy. He's the leading endoscopy expert at Queen's University, and his clinical and research interests include POEM, ESD, magnifying endoscopy, diagnosis and resection of early gastrointestinal neoplasia. It is uh, for me a great honor to introduce you to Professor Becara, and he will present us uh, a poem in difficult achalasia. Please, Professor Vicara. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Tanimoto, and thank you, uh, Dr. Moriyama, for the invitation. So I'm very uh, excited and really honored to, uh, to talk to everyone today about poem in complex achalasia. So I'll, hopefully you can see my screen um, here. Yes. So, um, sorry, one moment. Okay. So uh, these are my conflicts of uh, interest. And in terms of the objectives, I just want to introduce a uh, poem and the poem difficulty score. And being familiar with some of the challenges in type three achalasia, patients who have had multiple previous treatments and sigmoid achalasia. So in terms of the evolution of the myotomy, so it's really been the same treatment for over a hundred years. It started with the Heller uh, in 1914. It was initially an anterior and posterior myotomy. And eventually it evolved over the uh, next hundred years to where it is now, uh, where we have POEM is uh, generally the standard treatment. Over 15,000 have perform been performed worldwide thus far. So why POEM? Um, so it's an entirely endoscopic approach. Generally, patients have a hoarder, uh, shorter hospital stay, shorter procedure time, and a much quicker time to return to regular activities. They also generally have less uh, post-procedure pain as compared to standard uh, Heller myotomy. The big advantage is that the length and the position of the myotomy can be tailored to the patient, and it's effective in patients, uh, even those who have advanced sigmoid achalasia, type three achalasia and those that have had prior Heller. So we'll go over some cases. <clears throat> this is a, a case of an 82 year old lady that was diagnosed with type three achalasia about five years prior. 
whose symptoms have now progressed despite two prior uh, treatments, including pneumatic dilation and Botox. And you can see here her past medical histories, uh, nothing particularly remarkable, pretty typical uh, octogenarian. In terms of her symptoms, her Eckert score was six. She didn't lose any weight, but she had dysphagia with every meal, uh, occasional chest pain and regurgitated food every day. This was her manometry. So you can see here in terms of the, the hot colors are high pressure. And here you can see the spastic segment with a very high pressure, an IRP of 34 as well. And this is the distal spastic segment uh, consistent with type three achalasia. This is her barium esophagram, uh, which looks almost similar to diffuse esophageal spasm. You have this corkscrew pattern here in the esophagus. And at one minute, the column of barium was about 15 centimeters. And at two minutes, there was no barium column. And you can see the severe dysmotility that they comment on here in the uh, x-ray report. This is her endoscopy. So we're basically just going down and you can see there's a lot of very vigorous contractions. Uh, and every few centimeters, you think you're at the LES, but you're actually still in the mid esophagus uh, due to the very uh, vigorous nature of these spastic uh, contractions. And we're just advancing down here and you can see, it's also somewhat difficult to keep a, a straight luminal view due to the, the uh, vigorous contractions that are constantly uh, holding the scope and moving the scope. And there's uh, the gastric side. So the next case is a 41 year old lady. She has a 13 year history of achalasia and has had multiple previous pneumatic dilations with some improvement. She's otherwise healthy and recently had her symptoms progress in the past one to two years. So you can see here in terms of the number of pneumatic dilations she's had about five previously. In terms of her Eckert, it's eight. So she has dysphagia with every meal, chest pain every day, and regurgitation uh, with every meal. And here's her esophagus. So at that time, we weren't doing time bariums, but you could see a very dilated esophagus with retained material and this very acutely angulated uh, distal esophagus consistent with sigmoid achalasia. So this is her endoscopy. So we're in the stomach, we're in retroflexion. So you could see just with advancing the scope, you can see the squamous mucosa and the esophagus prolapsing out which is indicative of very tight GE junction. And then we'll um, deretroflex, and you'll see it from the uh, luminal view of the esophagus. So here is the uh, forward view. So just withdrawing the scope. So uh, very dilated esophagus, a lot of mucosal edema, um, and very acutely uh, angulated. So this is all consistent with advanced sigmoid achalasia. The last case is a 53 year old man with symptomatic achalasia since the age of 10. And he was referred for refractory achalasia and for potential poem. So in terms of her past medical history, the most notable is his previous treatments for achalasia. So in 1987, had a transthoracic myotomy. Then he had a wrap a year later due to refractory reflux. A few years later, then he had a transabdominal extension and myotomy, and then a Nissen fund duplication. And then from 1980 to 2012, uh, during that time, he had about 15 dilations. He's not sure of the nature of them. And then most recently, um, when he moved to our province, he's had a pneumatic dilation and Botox dilation. His Eckert was seven, so he had some weight loss, dysphagia with every meal, chest pain every day, and occasional regurgitation. Here was his uh, barium. So you can see they mentioned uh, moderate esophageal dysmotility. They didn't measure a barium column at the time, but you can see a fair amount of retained barium uh, and a high barium column. So this is, was a uh, manometry. So showing a kind of mid to distal esophageal um, spastic segment uh, consistent with type three uh, achalasia. And then this is endoscopy. So if you remember, he had a Nissen uh, fund application previously. So here in retroflexion, the distal end of the esophagus actually looks fairly patent, which was consistent with the manometry where you had that mid spastic segment. And then in the forward view, uh, when we come back a little bit, you can see uh, in a second, alumina occluding contraction beginning in the mid to distal esophagus, which you can see right here, which is consistent with what we saw um, on uh, manometry. 
So that distal area was painted and then kind of this mid uh, spastic segment. So now we're gonna go over some of the challenging cases in POEM. So type three, sigmoid and multiple previous treatments which will be kind of illustrated by those cases. So we had come up uh, through a modified Delphi in terms of the uh, different factors that were associated with a difficult POEM. And we came out with a score called the um, POEM difficulty score. You can kind of use the mnemonic foods to remember it. So fibrosis, uh, submucosal oozing, orientation, the distension of the tunnel and spastic contractions. I'll go over each of them and kind of show you what the score, uh, the scores uh, look like. Um, so what we did, we took 40 patients and we kind of performed, we pull on them and we compared the complex to non-complex patients in the short cohort. Um, and we did their follow up for the next 15 months. And you can see here in terms of the efficiency and the median home difficulty score. And essentially we found that uh, the uh, order of increasing difficulty went from non-complex poem, so type one, type two, non-sigmoid type, then type three, um, then prior myotomy, greater than four procedures, and generally the most difficult were sigmoid achalasia. So this is showing you the score here. Um, so no fibrosis uh, on the left. So you can see nice translucent submucosa, very easy to see the tissue planes. Uh, moderate fibrosis or F1 fibrosis looks kind of uh, like a web-like appearance. Uh, so that would be uh, one. And severe fibrosis, where you can't really make out the planes uh, between the muscle and the submucosa, uh, which you can see here on the right. So this would be kind of F2 of fibrosis. In terms of submucosal oozing, uh, absent to minimal, which would be a zero, so moderate submucosal oozing, which would look like this, where there's transient staining of the submucosa, and then diffuse oozing uh, is a case like this, where there's a diffuse oozing, you can't pinpoint the one area, and the submucosal planes are, are obscured. In terms of the orientation, uh, here on the left, we see uh, easy. So we're proceeding uh, straight with the tunnel. Uh, the scope is perpendicular uh, to the muscle fibers, which you can see here. And it's a uh, nice and straight tunnel, very easy to proceed. You don't get disoriented uh, very much at all. Here on the right is a, a difficult orientation. So again, we're proceeding here. Um, initially, it looks like we're going straight. And again, we try to keep the muscle fibers perpendicular uh, to the scope. And we're advancing here. But then things start to change a little bit and we're a little bit uh, unsure of how to proceed. So what actually happened here, that's the overlying mucosa. So this is the problem. We're actually in this area of the esophagus. And if we proceeded forward, we would just penetrate through the overlying mucosa and uh, create a mucosal perforation. So we actually had to reorient and kind of flatten the fold, similar to when you're doing a sigmoidoscopy to uh, make sure we stay in the plane. So this is a, an example of very difficult orientation which you can often see in sigmoid uh, achalasia. And finally, the, or almost at the end, uh, the distension of the tunnel. Here on the left, you can see a nice uh, wide open tunnel. We barely have to insufflate any air. There's a lot of working space um, in terms of when we're doing the uh, myotomy. And here on the right is an example of poor distension of the tunnel. So you can see I'm trying to do the myotomy and the overlying mucosa is very close um, and you're getting kind of very limited working space. So this would be poor distension of the tunnel. And this is good distension of the tunnel. And finally is the uh, spastic contractions. So here's an example on the left, no or minimal, cell, uh, or minimal spastic contractions in the luminal view. So you can see again, very dilated esophagus, no spastic contractions really, the scope can easily advance. In the tunnel, it's very similar, nice distended tunnel, no spastic contractions, very good maneuverability. Here on the right side, you'll see, again, very frequent spastic contractions. It's challenging to keep the uh, scope um, kind of straight in the luminal view because these contractions are constantly squeezing the scope and moving it. And you'll see very similarly in the submucosal tunnel, it's uh, similar. It's very challenging to move the scope because it, it almost feels like someone's holding it. 
uh, because of all these vigorous contractions, which you can see some of them, and some of them you can't see because they're holding the proximal um, endoscope. And then multiple previous treatments. So in terms of the difficult cases, so things to look out for when patients have a lot of uh, previous treatments for achalasia, they tend to have a lot of fibrosis and it's usually at the GE junction because that's mostly where treatments are focused in terms of Botox, pneumatic dilation, laparoscopic heller. And oozing, you tend to see it as well due to kind of ongoing inflammation or mucosal inflammation. And in the area of uh, multiple previous treatments, there's some neovascularization as well. In terms of type three achalasia, uh, as mentioned, the orientation can be difficult because of the frequent contractions. The distension of the tunnel is also impaired in type three achalasia, again, because of the vigorous contractions. And they also can hold the scope, making maneuverability very difficult because it feels like almost like someone's putting their hand on your scope and holding it while you're trying to move around. Sigmoid achalasia is generally the most difficult. Fibros fibrosis can be severe due to stasis. There's a lot of neovascularization from the uh, edema and the chronic inflammation. And orientation uh, can be challenging as well due to the thick and disordered muscle fibers. Uh, and as I showed you that case earlier, you can think you're at the GE junction, but it's actually just an acute angulation. So as I mentioned earlier, the order of incre increasing difficulty of the POEM uh, difficulty score we found went from non-complex to type three, prior surgical myotomy, greater than four treatments, and then sigmoid achalasia. So this is quite useful when you're training someone in POEM as you generally wouldn't want to start with sigmoid achalasia. And this gives you kind of a framework for advancing uh, the training and the cases in uh, a trainee, or if you're early on in your POEM experience of how to progress with your subsequent cases, um, rather than going from you know non-complex to greater than four treatments. Um, so it gives you kind of a progression of how to, uh, to advance your training. So we'll get back to the cases. <clears throat> so the first lady, the 82 year old lady with type three achalasia with a five year history and kind of recent uh, decline of her symptoms. So this was her poem. Um, so we ended up doing a 19 centimeter myotomy. So here we're injecting, and then we do a very superficial incision just of the epithelium until we get to the submucosa. We do about a two to three centimeter incision and then we'll get into the submucosa and we'll tunnel down um, to the gastric side. So here, uh, we just got into the submucosal space and then we'll just uh, dissect the submucosal fibers. Here is the completed tunnel. And then we'll uh, do the myotomy. So you can see in, in her case, which is not atypical of type three, it's a very thick muscle and a lot of spastic contractions making it very difficult to complete the myotomy. So sometimes you have to cut from over and go down rather than from down up, which is the typical way, because you may damage the overlying mucosa. So you can see how maneuverability can be challenging uh, in these cases. So her case at that time took 92 minutes. Her difficulty score was three. So it's uh, now probably about 70 months or so after her poem, uh, but she's asymptomatic, eating and drinking well. Uh, without any uh, symptoms whatsoever. Um, and her pre-POEM score was, uh, Eckert score was six. This is her barium, so pre and post. You can see things empty very well. There's no barium column at all. And then her pre and post manometry. So you can see that spastic segment is completely gone and the LE is, is nice and relaxed with an IRP of 13. The next case was the young lady with the multiple previous pneumatic dilations and the advanced sigmoid achalasia. So here you can see again, very edematous mucosa. So submucosal injection, uh, again, a superficial incision and then uh, tunneling down, you can see there's maybe uh, F1 fibrosis. So again, we very carefully proceeded um, with the tunneling and subsequent myotomy, which I'll show you here. So you can see again, a very thick muscle but here you can see the tunnel is nice and distended. It's very easy uh, to advance. Your working space is nice. It's not tight like the last case with the type three achalasia. So we uh, complete the myotomy and then closure. And she's been quite well uh, after her poem, um, only intermittent dysphagia, but otherwise is doing uh, very well. And here is her pre and post to show you an endoscopic change. So if you remember pre, 
with advancing the scope, there's squamous prolapse. And if you see here on the right, uh, the G junction is patent and patchless. There's no squamous prolapse. So nice relaxed uh, esophagus. And finally, the last case, the patient with the advanced uh, type 3 achalasia and many, many treatments in the past. So this is uh, his myotomy. So similar, inject in size, tunnel down to the GE junction. And you'll see here in a second, in terms of the GE junction was very uh, scarred and a lot of, uh, um, you can see almost adhesions and there's some sutures, which you'll see in a second. So very difficult to make out the anatomy at the GE junction. But if you stick to the same principle, just stay above the muscle and very slowly dissect, uh, things generally uh, will go well. The myotomy was completed fairly easily. And again, we see here endoscopically, everything was nice and relaxed. The G junction was patent before, but now here, the spastic segment you can see is nice uh, and relaxed. We don't have those high pressure contractions anymore. So he has been well postponed, uh, occasional regurgitation and occasional dysphagia, but otherwise much better than prior. This is his pre and post barium. You can see uh, here the, the high barium column and here things very rapidly uh, empty. And here is his manometry pre and post. Again, that high pressure segment is completely gone. So in conclusion, uh, POEM is safe and effective for even complex achalasia. The aspects that contribute to a challenging poem include fibrosis, oozing, orientation, the distension of the tunnel, and spastic contractions. And the order of increasing difficulty of poem appears to be from non-complex type 1 and type 2, type 3 achalasia, prior myotomy, greater than 4 treatments, and finally sigmoid achalasia. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Becara, for your wonderful presentation. And I remember everybody at the webinar that we will have a time for uh, questions and answers at the end of the webinar. So please uh, put your questions in YouTube, in the YouTube platform. And also, uh, I, I will try to, we, we will try to answer to all of your questions. And uh, our next next presenter will be uh, Professor Minoda from Kyushu University. He is an assistant professor uh, from the Department of Medicine and Bioregulatory Science. Uh, he's a member of the Department of Hepatology and Pancreatology at Kyushu University Hospital. He has a PhD from the Kyushu University. He, and he also has more than 90 publications of high impact and more than 300 citations. His research interests are gastrointestinal mucosal barrier function uh, and dysmotility of the gastrointestinal tract. Also the efficacy of endoscopic ultrasound with artificial intelligence for the diagnosis of gastrointestinal stromal tumors. So it is an honor for me to present you, uh, Professor Minoda from Kyushu University, and he will be our next presenter. Please, Professor Minoda. Hello. <clears throat> Well, thank you, Dr. Miguel. So it, it's a great pleasure for me to talk here in this meeting. So I will share my slide. Please wait. So can you see my slide? Yes. Okay. So today I will talk about our advanced technique in gastro sorry, gastric and duodenal defect repair. So first I want to explain myself. So my name is Yosuke Minoda. I'm our special my specialty is a gastrointestinal tumors, especially for our ESD or uh, sometimes do our uh, uh, interventional use. And so I graduated the Nagasaki University here. So and now but now I'm working in Kyushu University Hospital here. 
So my hometown is the Fukuoka city. So someone knows about my hospital. Hi, my hometown. This is because my hometown is very famous uh, in the ramen or sometimes very delicious food. And also, there are very famous uh, singer, oh, Dr. Ga uh, sorry, Julian Luis Galela sung My Hometown. So, first, I want to explain about the history of endoscopic resection. So, this is a history. So, as the first generation, EMR was started, and then next, ESD came appear. And the late century, EFTL is sometimes have a big, really big topic. And gradually, the post-treatment defect are becoming larger and sometimes very deeper. For example, when we did do our EFTL, of course, the, uh, the defect is a very deeper and complete defect we can see. Muscle layer is also resected. In Japan, this EFTR procedure is not covered by national insurance. And so today I will mainly talk about the def mucosal defect after EMR in the ESD, but sometimes I will talk about our uh, wall defect. So this is today's agenda. So when the post ESD and EMR ulcer should be closed. So please remember three situations. So as you know, there is no need to close post ESD ulcer generally, especially in the gastric ESD. So may, many reviews uh, show that there is no uh, statistical difference between clipping after ESD, the, the delayed perforation rate or post-ESD coagulation syndrome will not decrease. However, in high-risk group, post-gastric ESD should be closed, it, in my personal opinion. But so recently, a very big study was uh, <clears throat> analyzed in Japan. In this study, the about 8,000 gastric ESD case was analyzed. And so the patient was classified into bleeding list uh, the, using a scoring system. For example, when the patient have a chronic kidney disease with hemodialysis or uh, they, they are taking on medical care with warfarin or DOAC, they are classified into a very high risk person. The blade in that uh, group, the bleeding risk is very high, about 30%. And so this is a very good point. Usually we don't have to close the uh, post ESD ulcer, but in the very high risk group, it is a very good option to close their ulcer. And the second situation, post duodenal ESD or EML ulcer should be closed even in non perforation cases. As you know, during the procedure of e uh, duodenal ESD or EMR is a very dangerous. This is because the duodenum wall is a very thin and sometimes difficulty obtaining a good lifting sometimes. And after procedures, pancreatic juice and bile juice will be sprayed to our ulcer and which lead our uh, delayed perforation even in EMR. And some report showed the uh, efficacy of uh, closing of the ordinal ulcer post ESDU or EMR. Interestingly, the delayed population will occur uh, usually within three days after procedures. And so you should keep ulcer closed for at least three days. And the final situation is a you know, perforation should be closed. And uh, when we see our clinical practice update uh, published by AGA guidelines, uh, and endoscopic sutures such as our clip or OTSC is used for perforation of less than two centimeters. When we encounter the perforation, uh, which is larger than two centimeter, we have to suture using a combination of end suture or snare, OTSC or crepe. If so, 
how, we have to know how to close uh, the defect. Today, so of course I know there is so many method to close the, but now I will show the main four types of closure method. So first one is the most popular one, uh, sorry, uh, before, so, sorry, sorry. Uh, first I have, we have to know why we have to combine the some uh, method to close the big ulcers. This is because clip only suturing have a very low success rate. Late. Only 59% of post ESD ulcers could be successfully closed using only clips. And so an assistive device is necessary for closing a post ESD ulcer in the stomach. So what is the assistive device? So this is the most popular and famous one, loop with clip method closing the snare after fixing to the edge of a mucosal defect using clips. So recently in Japan, some dedicated device uh, is available. When we use this type of end loop or flex loop, we can easily close the mucosal defect with the combination of loop and clips. After putting many clips uh, to the edge of the ulcers, uh, finally we can close the ulcer like this. When pull back the line, the ulcer is closed, will be closed. So this method have our advantage. So this is a bit very cheap method, not so expensive. And so I think this is a very popular way to close the mucosal defect. And this method can be used in an, another part, for example, colon or uh, duodenum, or of course in a stomach. So in our data, you can keep ulcer crowds for at least three or five days when you use this clip with thread method. So, sorry. Another way is our traction band with clip. So very similar way to our, uh, many similar way is published in the English literatures. For example, we call it TBEC. For example, when we use this TBEC method for a collector ESD, after finishing the ESD, we can close their ulcer using this method. First, we will put their clip with loop and as and then we will put the clip to the opposite side of the ulcer and after shortening the and smalling the ulcer we can close the post ESD ulcers we only with clip. So, but now I want to show your new devices to close the defect. So in uh, North America and sometimes South America or Middle East America, uh, this type of overstitch would be our famous all in one system to sutures. But this system is not available in Japan. On the other hand, in Japan, we can use a hand suturing device. So when we use our this device, we can use our uh, uh, needle with line, so which is used for our surgical treatment. When we use our this hand suturing device, we can close the ulcer like this. I will show you 
some procedures in my hospital. After ESD, gastric ESD, we can close this ulcer using our this hand endoscopic hand suturing device. We can suture the ulcer continuously like this. And gradually the ulcer size is shortening. And finally, we can close the ulcer completely. So this method have our advantage of our suturing. So when we use this device, we can close the ulcer for a complicated shape. Of course, it requires very high endoscopic skill, but we can close. So furthermore, when we use this device, we can close a wall defect. So this is our report from our Professor Goto. He is the developer of this hand suturing device. He did our EFTR for GIST case. And after finishing the resection, now we can see a big wall defect. He closed the muscle layer, muscle defect uh, using this hand suturing device first. And after finishing the closure of muscle uh, wall defect, and then he, oh, sorry. And then he closed the mucosal defect. And so when we use our, uh, this method, we can close the wall defect uh, in the double layer suturing, like our surgical or uh, procedures. And furthermore, this endoscopic hand suturing device can close also the fistula tightly, uh, even when OTSC was not success. So we encountered the fistula case uh, for our acute pancreatic, uh, acute pancreatitis. We tried to close the fistula here after drainage, drainage. So we tried to use the RTSC device, but it was not success. And so we did our burning our, for our mucosa to promote the healing. And then we closed the ulcer with a hand suturing device like this. After one month, the fistula was uh, tightly uh, closed. And so we can close this fistula uh, successfully. So uh, another way is also published. So this is called low, lorum re reopenable clip over the line method. So in this, Oh, Dr. Miguel? Yes, probably we have some connection problems. Oh. Yes, 
But uh, now maybe we can uh, continue uh, with the transmission by YouTube. Uh, now I think that we have a good uh, connection. Yeah, you know, as I said, we just start from restart from the Rome, introducing Rome procedure. Uh, okay, okay. From this slide. Dr. Yes, Modiema. Please share, your, please share your slides. Please share. Ah, okay, sorry. Can you see my slide? Not yet. Thank you. Yes, yes, from this one. Okay. So now the new method, in this method is our combination with our conventional clip and with line. So this clip is used uh, with lines, sorry. So, uh, mm. so endoscopist use a clip with line like this gradually, uh, the ulcer it will be closed. This line is used for anchor, and after finishing the closure, this uh, clip with lining in one side. But this, for this method, you have to use a clip which have a hole in the top. So in Japan, the only one clip uh, called the sure clip. This is made by our uh, Chinese company. Sure Creep can is also sorry. Sure Creep is all, only device to do this device. After the line is affixed to our uh, clip, and the one side is clipping, and the next clip is put in the another side after uh, sorry after putting the clip we can close the ulcer uh, uh we can close the ulcer after uh, pulling the line and finally we can close the ulcer like this so Regarding to a wall defect, we have a three way to close endoscopic hand suturing and OTSC and uh, roll. But in my personal opinion, they are, each way have their own advantage and disadvantage. For example, endoscopic hand suturing method is our, has a very big closure power and closeable size is large, but on the other hand, this method requires very large working space and procedure time is very long. On the other hand, OTSC device is are require very short procedure time and required very not not big working space. On the other hand, on this OTSC can close a very small size ulcer only with one OTSC. To summarize the management of wall defect, it's my personal opinion that so when you see a perforation or small wall defect, you can close only with clip, but when you see our middle or large wall defect, you have to use our assistive device or a new device, roll more hand suturing over several OTSCs. On the other hand, when you want to close a mucosal defect, uh, for a small mucosal defect, you can close it only with clip. But when you want to close a middle or large size mucosal defect, you have to use our assistive device uh, also, same to our wall defect. So this is the take home messages. 
Post ES endoscopic treatment ulcer of duodenum should be closed even in non perforation cases. So, in a high risk group of gastric ESD cases, to closure, closure post ESD ulcer would be a good option. So, and finally, clip only sutures have a low success rate. Large defects require assistive device or new device. Uh, thank you for your kind attention. I will finish my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Minoda, for your wonderful presentation. And uh, in the, I will, uh, I will have a, a, a the last presentation of Professor Wedo. The last presentation of this webinar will be uh, from Professor Wedo. He is the Vice Director of the Department of Gastrointestinal and Oncology at the Olsuk International Cancer Institute. And he is also a visiting professor uh, at the University Hospital in Cleveland, uh, Case Western Reserve University. And he was also a visiting professor at Malmoe University Hospital, Lund University in Sweden, uh, and uh, also a, a visiting professor of the Department of Gastroenterology at 301 PLA General Hospital in China, and finally a visiting professor of the Department of Endoscopy at the Fukuoka University Chikushi Hospital. He's a consular Japanese gastroenterological endoscopic society, also a counselor of the Japanese Society of Gastro Gastroenterology, a counselor of the Japanese Gastric Cancer Association, and a counselor of the Japanese Esophageal Society. He's an international member of the American so Society of Gastrointestinal Endoscopy, an associate editor of Digestive Endoscopy, associate editor of Annals of Gastroenterology, an associate editor of Endoscopy International. So uh, we will uh, see his video recorded presentation, please. Uh, yes, you can start. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for invitation to this webinar. And today I'm talking about the underwater endoscopic mucosal resection for gastric lesions. I may explain about the background and rationale for underwater EMR, and I want to share the cases and tips and tricks. On the background, ESD is established as a standard treatment method for early gastric cancer. However, it is somewhat time-consuming and expensive because it uses many devices and skill demanding, especially for small region located in a difficult area. An injection EMR is a practical alternative, but especially in the stomach, it is often difficult to smear the region without lifting devices such as grasping forceps, aspiration cap, or a ligation band. And the efficacy of underwater EMR is reported for colorectal and duodenal lesions. So I want to explain the concept behind the underwater EMR procedure. This method was initially developed by famous endosonographer Ken Bimmer. So during EUS, he found that the only mucosa and some mucosa is protruded into the lumen. However, the muscularis propria is always stay circular behind the some mucosa. So in this situation, if we capture the mucosa, the chance of perforation does not increase much. This method was initially reported for colorectal lesion, but after that, same procedure was reported for duodenal region as well. So, for rationale, the lumen is expanded in the air, so the region becomes large and flattened, and the mucosa becomes dense. 
so the snaring can be difficult. However, under the water, the lumen is collapsed, so region becomes smaller and then protruded into the lumen and becomes polypoid. And the mucosa is soft, so easy to capture the mucosa, including the lesions. Previously, we have conducted the randomized control trial of underwater AMR for colorectal lesion size between 1 to 2 cm, and then we found that the underwater AMR significantly improved the R0 resection rate and unblocked resection rate for these lesions. I want to explain about the technical tip of underwater AMR. To submerge the region, if there is air under water, always it creates a pressure gradient. So the air always push the water away from the procedure site. So initially it is very important to completely collapse the lumen and then infuse the water so that the water is stay at this site and then we can submerge the region. So in the stomach, it is important to suction all the air, especially in the antrum, and then totally collapse the gastric lumen and then infuse the water. Another technical tip for underwater EMR is the marking. In ESD, we usually put marking a few millimeters away from the margin of the region. However, underwater MR, it is better to put marking just next to the margin because it can act as an anchor and then facilitate capturing the region like this. For snaring of the region, you can put the snare from top to bottom like a conventional EMR. But under the water, sometimes mucosal fold becomes very close to the region. So it is useful to put the tip of the snare to just distal to the region and then separate the fold and then open the snare and capture the region like this. Another useful technique during underwater EMR is a torque and cream technique. In this technique, we anchor the tip of the snare just distal to the region and then slightly shaking or sometimes suction the water to primp the surrounding mucosa in order to capture more tissue in the snare. So I want to show the example. So this is a polypoid region located in a greater curvature. The biopsy shows adenocarcinoma for this region. With NBI, we can observe irregular vessel, and it is very important to check there is no flat extension on the base of the region. So we found that the irregular vessel is confined to the polypoid area and decided to perform underwater EMR. So the lumen is totally collapsed. Especially important to suck the air in the antrum. And after marking, we fix the tip of the snare to the just distal to the region and then we capture the mucosa including the region. Another benefit of underwater EMR is that we don't inject the solution so the surrounding mucosa is soft and easy to put the clip and the region was completely removed like this. So this is another region. The region located in the posterior wall 
Oh, that's the corpus. The region looks very flat, and we confirm the edge of the region with magnify any bi. We put marking just next to the region. So in the air, it looks very superficial and flat. But under the water, it becomes a bit smaller and then polypoy. And the surrounding mucosa is also very soft. So we fix the tip of the snare just distal to the region. And then open the snare and suction the water a little bit so the mucosa is come inside the snare and the marking is anchoring the mucosa and we can capture the region including surrounding mucosa So after that, we encounter the bleeding from the sun mucosa. And this is the new image enhancement mode, red dichromatic imaging, RDI. In this imaging, we can evaluate the bleeding point better than the conventional white light. And in this situation, I use the cap to stop the bleeding and then identify the bleeding point and apply the coagulation forceps to coagulate the vessel. And the lesion was completely removed in this technique. So the region was removed, including the marking like this. So previously uh, we have done underwater EMR for gas leak region in 32 patients. Median tumor size was one centimeter. So basically we apply this technique for small region. More than a half of the region located in the greater curvature. Because the region in the greater curvature, sometimes ESD is very difficult and challenging. About half of the region was allegacy cancer and eight region was adenoma. Probably we are selecting good case for underwater EMR. It means small region located in a greater curvature. The median procedure time is only 4 minutes, compared to ESD, significantly short time. And uh, we experience one aspiration pneumonia, but uh, severe adverse events was not experienced. For 15 allegacy cancer region, endoscopically complete resection rate was 100%, and histological R0 resection rate was also 100%. To make sure we select good indication region for underwater EMR. Recently, we published the usefulness of underwater EMR for gastric region in patients with familial adenomatous polyposis. So, in this case series, we found that the underwater EMR showed the unblocked resection rate of 88%, but R0 resection rate was not so good as 56%, but the actual local recurrence rate was quite low, 4%. And the adverse events rate is quite low as well. Another interesting thing was we experienced poor residual or local recurrence in this case series, but most of them could be managed by underwater EMR. So this is example. 
region was 5 cm superficial region located in a greater curvature. Initially, we tried to perform ESD, but there's many polyps around the region, and the greater curvature location was very difficult to perform ESD. We tried to dissect the sun mucosa and then eventually we experienced the perforation. Because the conventional clip was very difficult to apply, so we put OTSC over the scope clip to close the perforation hole and then terminated the procedure. And three months later, there was still some region was remaining. You can see micro papillary structure of neoplasia. Among the smooth surface polyposis. So in this time, we try to remove this region with underwater EMR technique. Fix the tip of snare distal to the region. Under the water, flat region become polypoid, and we could capture the region with a snare like this. After initial resection, we capture the region next to the previous wound subsequently. When we inject the solution, sometimes such kind of small remnant is very difficult to capture. But uh, under the water, mucosa remains soft, so easily capture the region subsequently to the previous resection. And if we continue this type of procedure, the region was completely removed like this. And follow-up examination did not identify the remnant region near the OTSC clip. Usefulness of underwater EMR for local residue was also reported for colorectal region as well. So if we inject the solution, only surrounding mucosa was lifted, and we cannot capture the remnant region after injection EMR. And eventually it was ablated like this. However, the underwater EMR, even though the region located in a scar, we can capture the region and the mucosa like So this is an example of salvage underwater EMR for recurrent region after gastric ESD. Post ESD scar is widely fibrotic, so beautiful doctor is okay, but very difficult to perform ESD again, and also injection does not lift the region very well. However, under the water, we can efficiently capture only region, even though it is located on the scar. And the region is removed with complete resection. So in summary, Underwater EMR for gastric region is safe, easy, and efficacious alternative treatment option to conventional EMR or ESD for small gastric region, especially it located in a greater curvature. And also it is beneficial for recurrent region after endoscopic treatment. Thank you for kind attention. Muchas gracias.
Thank you very much for your wonderful presentation, Professor Wedo. And I have some questions from the audience to the, our lecturers today. And uh, I have one question for Professor Becara. And uh, this question is, uh, what is the role of poem F? Um, is this, uh, does this uh, poem F still experimental? And do you think it is necessary at this point? So, good question. So, poem F is um, kind of poem with fundiplication, an endoscopic fundiplication. Um, and it's, uh, I, I think, in, in my opinion at this time, I think it's still evolving. Um, it definitely does show that there's a decreased incidence or decreased requirement for PPI use after. Um, but it's still as that it's an evolving uh, procedure and we don't know the durability of it at this point. Um, in my experience, though, that we don't have any patients that required surgical fund application after POEM. Um, everyone, should they develop severe GERD, um, respond very well to PPI. But I think there may be a role for it down the line after the procedure has kind of evolved and is a bit more mature and we have more data on its uh, durability for uh Oh, thank you. Thank you, Bob. And I have a question to Professor Minoda. And uh, does all middle and large ESD defects requires some method for uh, close the post procedure defect? Okay. Now, if all, uh, do you think that all middle and large ESD defects requires some closure method. So you, you mean what kind of assistive device is uh, suitable for our closure for large or middle sized defect? No, if it oh. is necessary. If, uh, if uh, okay, it... thank you so much. So in a gastric, gastric ESD, uh, sorry, uh, in a gastric cases, I think we have to uh, necessary to use our assistive device. Okay, but on the other hand, when you want to close a colorectal ESD or another part, the situation is quietly different, especially in a colorectal ESD, sometimes you can close only with clip, but in a stomach, you have to use our assistive device. Oh, thank you. And uh, I have uh, one question to Professor Uero. And uh, it is, uh, is there, is there is a type of snare better for underwater EMR? Uh, actually, I have no exact data, comparative data, but uh, in my practice, I prefer thin uh, snare. It's easy to capture the soft mucosa uh, efficiently. So I prefer thin snare. Sometimes monopolar snare is good. When I was in Sweden, I always use a uh, monopolar, uh, no, uh, monofilament, monofilament snare. For oh, the okay. procedure. Yes. Thank you. And I have one more question to Professor Becara. Do you think a previous pneumatic dilation for achalasia makes more difficult to perform poem? So I, I think a single balloon pneumatic dilation doesn't generally make a difference. So there's some old literature from the surgical literature and some from uh, the endoscopic literature, and it varies in terms of the number of previous treatments. Uh, some say two, some say uh, three or four or more, but generally... Uh, in my experience, I found that one or two, sometimes even three, doesn't make much of a difference. It's when you start getting up to four or more treatments. Uh, and same with Botox. So sometimes uh, referring physicians are scared to give a patient Botox. They say it will ruin the, their subsequent procedures. But I haven't found that it makes a big difference if it's one or two treatments. When it starts getting up to four or more is when you start seeing a bit more um, fibrosis. Um, but none of the treatments make it uh, impossible to do the poem. It just makes it a little bit more difficult, but it will never, you know, make the procedure uh, not doable um, if it's done by an experienced uh, physician. 
And I have uh, one question for on the, for Professor Wedo. Uh, do you think it's a risk of respiratory aspiration when performing underwater EMR? Do you carry out airway protection in all your procedures? Yes. Uh, actually, in my practice, we don't use uh, intubation or uh, even over... Eh? Over, over to, even over to, we don't use it. And, uh, but uh, we make the patient uh, head up position. So we put some, uh, our hospital bed can be uh, moved. So we keep the patient head up position. And also we try to avoid uh, too much insufflation. As I mentioned, sometimes too much insufflation also uh, cause some reflux, reflex of the uh, stomach water. So that is, uh, I think, a tip of the procedure. Yeah. And also, uh, do you change positions many times during EMR, uh, underwater EMR, to con in order to contain water inside the stomach? Yeah, that is also, I always ask, but uh, as I explained the principle, so if the room is totally collapsed, Usually, water is only stay there. So it's usually, uh, we always, almost always, we keep the patient in the same position and then complete the procedure. And uh, one last question to Professor Becara. Do you manage uh, mucosal and muscle perforation during OM? So, I guess the, the muscle perforation, so basically penetrating the muscle doesn't really matter if you keep the overlying mucosa intact. So we, and you do the myotomy. So I guess they're asking if you um, sever the longitudinal muscle and you're in the peritoneum or mediastinum. So generally you don't need to do anything if, if that occurs. Um, the important thing is you keep the overlying mucosa intact. So if you do uh, sever the overlying mucosa, generally that's easily managed by just simple clips. Um, so if there's a, a small focal uh, defect in the mucosa, uh, just using clips, closing them, you know, very slowly uh, from the luminal side uh, is generally adequate and it doesn't change the patient's uh, course uh, in terms of the recovery and, and the final um, uh, result for the patient. Yeah. Oh, thank you very much for all the presenters for your wonderful participations. And I I want to ask you if you if you have some final uh, remarks uh, for for your participations, uh, Professor Moriyama. Uh, oh, so sorry. All right. Okay. Uh, thank you again for the presenters. Oh well, yeah. Thank you. Thank you for thank you presenters for your wonderful and. Uh, Excellent presentation to us. Uh, we really appreciate it because uh, maybe your ex uh, to sh uh, it's really nice to share your knowledge and the tips and tricks for the new procedure and introducing new new procedure is quite uh, useful for our daily practice and can be implemented to the from now on. So uh, we just uh, we would like to learn more from you guys, and so uh, I just say I would like to say thank you for uh, your experience and uh, sharing with us. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you very much to you all. Thank and, you uh, very much. We will inform you thank about you. the next symposiums. Thank you very much. Uh, have a good night, everybody, and good morning. Take care, uh, everyone. Thank you. Have a nice day.